the next episode of the Klingberg Wing Mark II Development. I'm Rob Klingberg, your host. Today, we're going to have a very special video. You see, I have all kinds of stuff here on the table in front of me uh, to help answer questions one of my astute viewers sent in. Um, short little question. Seems simple enough, but it has a relatively complex, yet I think fascinating answer because it goes to the heart of one of the main design challenges of aircraft of this type. And I'm talking about ultralight aircraft that are very large. Something that has a large wingspan. We want it to be really lightweight so we can handle it on the ground, foot launch maybe. Maybe it's electric powered, something like that. And he asked about design constraints. And I'm going to talk about one of the key design constraints on ultralight aircraft. So, to get this straight, let me read the question from the viewer. This comes in from Clive, and Clive's pretty smart because he puts a bunch of uh, sucking up stuff here in the front of his question uh, to, to make me sound good. <laughs> That's very nice of you, Clive. Thanks. Uh, but, you know, he knows how to uh, get his question answered. And, and right before his question here, he says, uh, the, insight, the insights you provide are a real gift. So there you go. See, that's just like right over the top. And when you do that, you get a special video made. Okay, so he says, I was wondering what would be the design constraint on increasing the tube diameter a bit. And this is related to the video on the pilot's cage and talking about the tubing that goes into the pilot's cage. Uh, I take it tubes will be out of the airstream. Well, yes, they will. They'll be enclosed. And he says, I think he's saying, what happens if you make them a little larger in diameter? Because if they're out of the airstream, it doesn't matter. It's not going to be draggier. And uh, is there anything to be gained uh, by making them bigger in diameter? And that is an excellent question because there's about uh, a year's worth of engineering uh, training uh, that uh, is behind that question uh, in terms of answering it. So I've gathered up a bunch of stuff here today to attempt to explain this uh, on a... Uh, non-mathematical level and and hopefully we'll we'll have some fun along the way and I'll try not to crush my reading glasses there so uh, Clive nice question we set that aside over there get that out of the way and we begin now before I go too far you might want to pause the video go get a soda some of the drink a snack uh, I have a feeling we might be here a little while uh, be prepared to hit pause and go do something else and come back and watch some more of this video uh, because I have a feeling we're gonna run long here so, uh, what uh, Clive asked about was a design constraint. Uh, what is driving you to picking this diameter tubing for the pilot's cage? And, and I have one half of the pilot's cage here in front of me in its current development status. Uh, these are the two uprights, and this is the horizontal. It folds up like this for transportation. And in the back here, there's a, a, a cross beam that goes across the back like this. That'll get bonded on there. And then at the very back, goes an axle. I hope you can see that. Maybe I'll move it over. Axle goes at the back here uh, for the wheel. And there'll be a curved portion up front. Uh, and we'll review this in just a bit when we go look at the cockpit mock-up. Uh, so this tubing is an inch and a quarter inside diameter because it's formed on inch and a quarter diameter aluminum tubing. And uh, it's about uh, three layers thick, uh, about uh, a little less than 30 thousandths, about 25 thousandths uh, wall thickness. And uh, so, so it's quite thin wall, but it, it, it's very stiff. And uh, if you watch the other video, you see I'm going through a bunch of different uh, uh, tests and trials about uh, making this tubing for the cockpit. And why did it come out this diameter? And I'm testing tubing and breaking it and finding out all kinds of interesting things. And this is the diameter I choose. But how come I didn't go to larger diameter? If I went just a little larger diameter, wouldn't it be a lot stronger? And then I could go one less layer, and one less layer would remove more weight than I added because it's larger in diameter. It's only a quarter inch larger in diameter, quarter inch times pi, but then I'm getting rid of an inch and a quarter times pi if I can get rid of a layer. I think that's what Clive's getting at. Reduce the wall thickness increase that diameter so I can reduce the wall thickness and keep the same strength tubing overall. And at first, it seems perfectly logical. In fact, it is logical. Uh, 
without certain constraints placed on it. Uh, and what happens with ultralight aircraft like this, we get ourselves backed into uh, what I call a design corner. Uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. You're, you're, you're literally painted in, engineered into a corner that you can't get out of. You can't turn right, you can't turn left. Uh, you're stuck with what you have. Um, excuse me, wet my whistle. What happens with composite aircraft in the ultralight areas, uh, people end up designing and building what I like to call black aluminum. Uh, they end up with the same wall thicknesses, uh, same size components as if you built the aircraft out of aluminum. Well, the carbon fiber is way stronger than aluminum, so you don't need that much wall thickness to carry the loads. Well, why'd they make the wall thickness so large? Why'd they make it the same as aluminum? Uh, and they end up with an aircraft that uh, is really expensive, um, weighs slightly more than an aluminum aircraft, and is built like a brick outhouse. You can't kill it. Um, and that's not what we want. Uh, I think in the early days of designing ultralight carbon fiber aircraft, this was pretty common. The designers were of my age. They're uh, practically a senior citizen. And they learned their engineering years ago on wood and metal aircraft and this carbon fiber stuff comes along and says, oh, cool, I'm going to go use that, design a new aircraft, and, and it's just going to be out of this world. Uh, but they are stuck with uh, design concepts that they've learned and used for decades. And it's hard to get out of that box. Uh, very, very difficult. Uh, somebody like me that comes along in the middle of the carbon fiber era, I go, oh, I could do this, I could do that. And then I really try to push myself to do things that are really unexpected, out of the box, that probably won't work, but I give them a go anyway, uh, just to see what I can get out of it and what I can make the material do. In other words, a material driven as opposed to design standards driven. That's what I'm trying to do with this aircraft. Yet, as I, I've worked on this thing uh, mentally and on paper for a decade now, and I have worked at it left and right trying to get the weight down, and for a 50-foot wingspan, really hard-pressed to get less than uh, 100 pounds. It, it is very difficult to build one of these wings uh, for less than an average of 2 pounds per foot of wing. Uh, it was about 2 pounds per foot of wing for my original wing, and, and the same is true now. Uh, and I think if you look uh, through the literature, you'll find some early composite aircraft designs that ran into this problem. Uh, and maybe they were just unaware and they just went off designing and built it and ended up with something that was too heavy. I think if you look at the American Eaglet, um, I don't know if that used any carbon fiber, I think it was fiberglass, uh, but for what it was, a pretty heavy aircraft. Um, the Carbon Dragon, uh, great design, nice flying glider, was originally intended to be foot launched, but I don't think any of them have ever been foot launched. I think they come in at about 150 pounds. Uh, and we have the Swift, which started out very light. Uh, the first one was all metal, and then they went with composites and did an excellent job designing it. And, you know, by the time you put the accoutrement on it and built it for durability for daily usage, you had a 125, 135-pound aircraft. Uh, and, of course, now we have the Swift Light. They put a major re-engineering effort into it, did a fabulous job, and they got the weight down to 106 pounds. Uh, and there's a couple other foot launch gliders out there that are being worked on right now. There's one very similar to mine, weighs about 150 pounds. Uh, there's another one over in Europe, weighs about 150 pounds. And when you get this much wingspan and this much aircraft, you weigh about 150 pounds. But gosh, we've got all these special materials. Uh, I even got this new poltruded stuff, super, super strong. How do we use it to best effectiveness to get the aircraft weight down? And as you work the aircraft weight down, you find yourself in this engineering corner and the design constraint is the critical buckling length or just critical buck length. Um, the loads in these types of aircraft are spread out over a large area and our skins are very thin, very, very thin, a few thousandths of an inch sometimes. Uh, some of the skins on uh, this aircraft will be um, five thousandths of an inch on each side of a sandwich panel that's a sixteenth of an inch thick. Uh, so really, really thin skins reinforced by foam and then they have uh, ribs in them and a spar 
uh, and we have to arrange it all so that we don't get any buckling of surface. And the same is true of the tubing. Um, if I build the tubing no stronger than it needs to be uh, for the loads that are going to be encountered with this design, I end up with wall thicknesses that I could crush in my hands. It, 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 they end up being like these Coke cans that I have here. here here's a can that carries, what, uh, seven and a half ounces of fluid, which is quite a bit. And the can weighs nothing. Uh, and, and you know these skins are very thin on here. And how come these things don't get all banged up in transport? How come they don't just fail? Well, they're pressurized. Uh, the the soda is carbonated, sealed up. They're pressurized. They're solid. You can grip them really hard. You can stack stuff on top of them. They're fine. Uh, the tubing for my gliders can be very hard to pressurize it. Uh, it might be interesting to fill the tubing of the pilot's cage with soda, uh, you know, a unique in-flight beverage, I guess, uh, but not very practical. Uh, so I have to make the tubing not only withstand the flight loads, but they have to withstand handling loads and transportation loads and everything else. And the design limit is critical buckling. So as you go larger in diameter for a given skin thickness, the ease of buckling, it becomes easier to buckle it. As you go larger in diameter, if you keep the skin thickness the same or the wall thickness, it becomes easier to push in on it and buckle it. And you know, as soon as you buckle this stuff, it's going to fail. Um, and of course, they have a couple bulkheads on here. They have a bulkhead that's stamped in here, and they got one that's curled, wedged on on top here. And without those bulkheads, well, geez, it's it's really flexible. Uh, there's no strength to this side to side at all. Uh, there's still some strength this way, right? As long as it doesn't collapse. And if I'm lucky here, I'm going to give you a little demonstration. If you've been an astute observer. You've been looking over my shoulder and see I got something set up to show you what happens if you have a heavily loaded tube. This is a tube, and it's loaded vertically. If it buckles, you're done. And let me show you that here. We have one of our handy dandy Coke friends right here underneath these lovely concrete pavers. And he's doing fine. He's holding up those pavers. I think each paver. I think each paver is about 20 pounds or so, something like that. So there's 40 pounds sitting on top of this can that weighs, hey, let's weigh it. Where's the scale? Hey, who took my scale? Let's get that scale out here. This weighs 0.026 pounds. It weighs nothing, but it's holding up all that weight. And that is a tremendous strength to weight ratio. It's working good. There it is right there. But all I have to do ready for this. All I have to do is come in with my two sticks. If I do this really quick, I'm going to buckle the wall and we'll see what happens. Here we go. Whoa! There we go. End of the tube. And that's what my tubing would look like on my pilot's cage if it buckled on a landing. So we can't have buckling. So all of this tubing is designed to prevent local buckling. And that's the design constraint that drives uh, me to a particular diameter. Now, in order to resist the hand gripping and local buckling, I need about three layers. Uh, and I would still need three layers at an inch and a half. Here's the inch and a half tubing for the leading edge of this glider that, that I've built up, and it's going to go in the aircraft. This is about three layers thick. And it is a little squishy on the end, but it goes inside the wing, so that's okay. It's thicker here in the center to take the loads. But this is designed to prevent, uh, to avoid local buckling. Uh, could I go thinner on this? Maybe. Uh, I'd prefer not to take that gamble. Uh, local buckling is very hard to predict. Uh, even with the best numerical models, better to not take that chance. So that's the design constraint. If I went larger in diameter on this, I can't take away a layer of skin because it's not going to have the crush resistance that it needs. Uh, and it's not going to have the, um, uh, might not have the bending strength that it needs. Um, so uh, that's where we are. So how do we get around this? Uh, well, in some cases you don't. Here I am, pilot's cage tubing, uh, three layers thick, and it is what it is. Still very lightweight. Uh, larger in diameter might be easier to hold on to, might not be, I don't know, neither here nor there in my mind. A smaller in diameter, probably too small to get a good grip on. Um, 
larger in diameter. Would I like larger? Maybe, inch and a half. My original wing had inch and a half uh, diameter tubing. And, and I plead guilty on my original wing. The pilot's cage on that was essentially black aluminum. It was built with wall thicknesses that were similar to aluminum tubing. Uh, and it was probably about five pounds heavier than it needed to be. Uh, so that is the design challenge that we face. So uh, on my original wing, let me pull up the wing tip here from my original wing and show you uh, some of the design approaches for dealing with local buckling uh, or critical buckling. This D tube, it's out at the wing tip, is uh, only one layer of three ounce cloth. This is about five thousandths of an inch thick. And it is supported on the inside with uh, white bead styrofoam of all things and some blue styrofoam in the nose and it had styrofoam ribs in here. That's it. This thing it was a flying eggshell. Uh, it was not particularly durable for ground handling and that's the design compromise that I had made. Uh, this aircraft was designed to attempt to break the world's distance record at that time back in the mid 80s, mid to late 80s and uh, I had made the decision that I will build certain points into this aircraft that are hard points. We can actually pick it up and carry it, uh, but the rest of it is designed just for flight loads. And when I designed for flight loads, the skin got so thin that you literally couldn't pick it up on the ground uh, unless you picked it up by the hard points. And several times the wing was damaged by people who just didn't know better, came up, wanted to help pick it up, and they it could literally just crunch their hand into that D2. Um, but uh, it was a sacrifice, a compromise that I made to keep the aircraft weight down. Uh, and I figured the aircraft's only going to be used a few times, maybe a dozen at, at most, and uh, its durability is a secondary issue. Now, I've taken the same approach with this current wing uh, with some of the components, the winglets and the tips of the wings from the winglet outboard. I've designed and built those to be what I call expendable. Uh, they're built using model aircraft methodology. They're extremely light, and you could put your fingers through them if you tried, but they are fine for flight loads. If somebody bumps into them on the ground, or you bump into a tree or something like that, you're probably going to damage them and have to fix them. Uh, or you'll carry a spare winglet, and just put the winglet on and be done with it that way. Uh, but it's a way of keeping the weight down uh, by just working a little bit outside of the normal engineering box and say, look, Parts of this aircraft are just going to have to be expendable uh, so I can keep the weight down uh, overall. And sometimes you have to make the design decisions that way. So uh, let's take a little, I'm going to get you turned around here, we're going to take a little further look at the pilot's cage and understand how some of the loads occur in the pilot's cage. And we're going to come back and talk about these fittings here somewhat and a little bit more about wall thickness in the fittings and, and how that becomes a design driver. So hang on for a second, I'm going to spin you around here. Uh, sorry for the cord in the way. Let me see if I can get this out of the way. I've moved the lights around, spun around so you can see the, uh, the cockpit mock up here. Uh, you probably saw this in another video. Uh, this is a very crude, rough mock up uh, of the cockpit area. Uh, but what I showed you up on the table earlier uh, were these two uprights and this one horizontal. It's a little bit longer back here, so it goes back to where the axle will be for the wheel. Now, these front struts here will actually be cables. Uh, there'll be a cable that runs up on each side back here, and there's going to be a, a tail boom back here, and same kind of cables in back. Because I'm not attaching the pilot to the pilot's cage, go watch that video, um, to, to see that I'm actually attaching the pilot directly to the wing up in here. Um, the loads of the pilot's weight in, under the G-forces do not get put into the pilot's cage. They can put it directly into the wing. And that makes sense because that's where the spars are. That's the structure that's really designed to carry load. I really only need a pilot's cage that's strong enough for ground handling. Uh, setting it down on the ground, bouncing it down on the ground, uh, picking it up, twisting around. So here's where the loads are. You have a, a potential landing load where you come down, you hit hard, and this whole thing goes down to the ground. And you get compression this way. You get G-forces of the wing. You get a 100-pound wing pushing down on these uh, four tubes, and uh, at one G, well, that's 25 pounds per tube. That's nothing. Uh, one layer of carbon fiber would withstand uh, that type of vertical load on there. Uh, obviously, one layer of carbon fiber is going to be like a Coke can. You, you bump it once, 
it buckles, you're done. Um, the horizontal tubes, uh, they get some bending in the middle this way when you have to pick it up uh, to run with it. And uh, you're going to get some loads when you're managing it like this on the ground. Uh, but the big thing, the big loads on these tubes is this way. Uh, when you get a torsional loop, you're on the ground like this, and you're holding the pilot's cage, and you get a gust of wind, and the wing wants to yaw on you. And when it yaws, it's going to put a torque in this whole cage. Now, that torque is mostly going to be carried by the cables, front and rear. But it will put a load into these fittings down here. And that load is going to be this tube trying to bend this way. There'll be some loads this way, fore and aft. The cables will take that. These fittings will easily take that. But these loads where it's going to want to torque and put a load like this, where it's going in like this and out like this, that puts a bending load on these fittings. And these fittings have to be designed, surprisingly, the one case, that bending case, ends up driving the whole design. Uh, the components must be thick enough. Now, I could have made these tubes so that they were thinner in the middle and thick at the end to take those bending loads that are at the ends thinner in the middle to save weight. However, you end up in that design corner that says, oh, three layers. I need three layers to keep from crushing it in my hand. By the time I have three layers up here, I have enough. I don't need four or five. Three is enough. Um, same thing down here. So I can't, I can't go to one layer or two layers here. It's just not possible. Uh, you're just crushing in your hands, or if you bump it with your shoulder, your head, it's done. So, I'm driven by local buckling there, in that case. Uh, and once I solve the local buckling problem, I already have a tube that's strong enough to take the loads, the fittings at the ends. Now, that's my calculations by hand, my little computer work, spreadsheet. Could be wrong, I've made mistakes before, but the benefit, the, 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 the plus side here is pilot's cage is detachable, uh, all of the tubing's replaceable, uh, if I've made a mistake and I need to have these ends a little bit thicker, I can do that. Uh, I can go back and rebuild and, and take care of that, uh, substitute some tubing. So, um, with the pilot's cage and how it's employed on this aircraft, that, those are the design drivers that drive me to uh, a particular uh, thickness of tubing, a particular diameter of tubing. A larger diameter tubing would be able to take that bending better but we're still at the three layers because of the local buckling. Once again, back in that design corner. So I've developed a solution for that, and you've seen it in the other video. I'm going to switch you around again. Okay, so we're back over here. Um, give me a little sip here. So I came up with this for the torque tubes, which are probably not actually going to be in the aircraft. I'm going to go with cables. Um, but it's the... Uh, sandwich panel tubing, where there's uh, this particular one has one layer of fiberglass on the inside, has a sixteenth of an inch of Arex foam, uh, which I get out of Germany. I think I'll put a little thing here telling you where I get it, because uh, they're great folks, and uh, if you need Arex foam, you should get it from them. Carbon fiber around the outside. Um, so we get two layers of cloth, and it's lightweight cloth. It's uh, uh, three ounce fiberglass on the inside, and standard five point six ounce uh, carbon fiber on the outside, and this tubing weighs only 1.15 ounces per foot. It's one inch diameter tubing. This uh, inch and a quarter stuff that I have here weighs about 1.6 ounces per foot. So a half an ounce per foot heavier for that extra layer. So you're saying, hey Raul, why don't you <laughs> use your brilliant new sandwich panel tubing in the cockpit uh, frame? Good question. Um, and once again, practicality rears its ugly head and I needed to move forward with the project. I didn't want to wait for stuff to come in from Germany. I had plenty of material on hand. I didn't have a lot of foam. So I just went ahead and made the tubing this way. If I want to save weight, the pilot's cage is going to weigh maybe five pounds. I might be able to knock out four to eight ounces out of that by going to the sandwich panel uh, stuff. And um, I can do that later. I can build another pilot's cage, bolt it on. It'll be lighter. And I might do that. For testing and educational purposes and learning, I've decided to take one of the samples that I made. This has got carbon fiber on the inside, bi-directional woven, 5.6 ounce, 
and uh, 1.8 ounce Kevlar on the outside, one layer. And this stuff is really rigid. It has all of the uh, buckling stiffness that you want. That buckling stiffness is a direct result of the sandwich panel method. You can go read about sandwich panels, composite sandwich panels, many places on the internet, how they work. Um, this is going to be the cross tube here on the pilot's cage uh, that is behind the pilot. I'll be sitting right about here. This will be right behind me. And the axle for the wheel will be back here, just like that. Um, and then I'll find out, how does this stuff, how does this sandwich panel tubing hold up over time? Uh, does it get crushed? Does it get dinged and dented and uh, destroyed that way? Uh, worst comes to worst, it gets banged up and, and I just cut it loose and I put in a regular piece of tubing and we're good to go. Or I just build a whole new pilot's cage out of uh, uh, sandwich panel tubing that has one more layer on the outside, something like that. Oh. Right, one more layer. Now we're back to three layers. See, it, once again, that's that uh, engineering corner about the critical buckling. If this is susceptible to damage on its surface, and I add a layer to uh, deal with the ground handling loads and just transportation stuff, I'm back to the three layers again. And this stuff's a lot harder to make than this stuff. This is three layers. That's th This would end up being three layers. Now, where this might begin to pay off is large leading edge tube. I, I can imagine it, a normal hang glider built out of this, a normal flex wing. Uh, two inch diameter tube, two and a half inch diameter tube, uh, made sandwich panel style, could be phenomenally strong and incredibly lightweight. I can imagine, you know, having built some hang gliders myself here and there along the way, some flex wings, what if you could build a modern flex wing and have it come in at 50 pounds? That'd be pretty cool. That'd be really light. You might be able to do that with tubing like this. Very labor intensive, expensive materials, uh, but if you don't like lugging around 90 pounds all the time, it might be worth it. So, uh, I, I think there's a future for this tubing. I'm gonna test it out on my design here and see how it holds up. So right now, we understand uh, where we are with uh, local buckling and how we're back in a corner and why, why it's this diameter not some larger diameter, uh, why it's this many layers, and it's all driven by uh, buckling uh, of the skin. And you're thinking, geez, are you, are you really getting maximum utility out of these fancy materials? And my quick answer is no. Uh, these materials were carry loads far in excess of what you can deal with in terms of controlling the buckling. Now currently on, our, on like the Swift and Millennium and some similar aircraft, most of that buckling is dealt with by using sandwich panels and by doing what's called a monocoque or semi-monocoque construction method. And, and I'll cut away here for a second, uh, and you're looking at a picture now, a uh, drawing that shows you monocoque versus uh, semi-monocoque. Monocoque is bulkheads and stressed skins where the skins carry all the loads and the bulkhead keeps the shape. And then the semi-monocoque has lingerons in it and the lingerons allow you to go to thinner skins and still carry the loads, and the lingerons uh, prevent local buckling. Uh, and the um, engineer has to be very careful on a semi-monocoque structure that you don't end up putting more weight in the lingerons uh, than you saved by making the skin thinner. Uh, it's quite a design challenge and usually involves quite a few iterations. Um, so, uh, with our current gliders, we're kind of semi-monocoque, but we're using construction methods that don't take full advantage of that monocoque type structure. Tubing. Tubing is full monocoque. The bulkhead in this tubing is the foam sandwich that goes between the two layers. The two layers are the skins that are carrying the loads. Foam doesn't really carry any loads. It just keeps the skins in place and prevents them from buckling. And you have essentially a pure monocoque structure here. If it had a web down the middle of it or some discs in here, then it'd be semi-monocoque. Um, so, probably the most efficient structure, strength to weight ratio that you can get out there would be a um, full monocoque structure. The problem is, uh, how do we grab a hold of it? Uh, you've got to put fittings in there. We've got to attach the wings. Um, and it becomes a bit of a problem. Now, 
Here we have full monocoque structure. It's the tubing. This is three layers thick. But I gotta have. Uh, uh, I gotta attach it. It's gotta fold up. I gotta attach these pieces together. I gotta put a bolt through it. So I deal with it locally. I don't know if you can see it here. I'll, I'll run up another picture. Let's switch to that picture now. Um, but inside the tube, uh, there's a piece of uh, poultry carbon fiber tubing that runs across the inside. And then I've uh, reinforced it locally with uh, uh, flocks, cotton flocks, uh, to reinforce that tube. And that tube prevents uh, a buckling when the bolt is tightened. And we come back to me. So what we have here is we have a U-bracket uh, on the bottom uh, bar of the pilot's cage. It goes around the bottom like this, comes up around the sides, permanently attached to the bottom tube. And I have a little bolt through here, and the, the carbon fiber tube is bonded on the inside and prevents crushing it this way. So that crushing force from the bolt uh, would be a local buckling, and we don't want to have that happen. So I've reinforced it locally with a bulkhead, the bulkhead being that little piece of tubing that's in there. And the pull-truded carbon fiber tubing has tremendous compressive strength. And then once I uh, overcoat it with the, the cotton flocks, uh, it, its uh, crush strength is greatly increased. Now, uh, the, uh, just as an aside, these bolts might look pretty small to you. Uh, these are five millimeter bolts, and you're saying, oh my goodness, uh, that's really small for a pilot's cage. It looks so tiny. Uh, how's that going to hold everything together? Well, remember, I'm not carrying the pilot's loads through these bolts. Uh, only the handling loads. Plus, uh, let you in on a little secret, these are titanium bolts. They're really, really strong. Uh, they're made for racing bicycles. Uh, got them in from China. They're pretty nice. Uh, in fact, they're really, really nice and not too expensive. Um, so the bolts here are very, very strong. And because of the tubing that's in there, that prevents tear out. Now the plates that wrap around here, around the tube, what I've done is I've made them thick enough here to prevent tear out and crushing for that size bolt. Uh, and to save weight, uh, they're actually thinner where they wrap around the bottom down here. I built a mold uh, using the tube and some foam core stuff, and I molded this carbon fiber around it like this, took it off and sliced them up, and made my U-brackets that way so they're bonded onto the tube, and then they got some fillets in here uh, to prevent, keep it strong this way. And uh, there's only three layers down here, but there's seven layers. Uh, on, on the side flanges here, and the way that this is laid up. So it's, I'm trying to optimize the strength, the weight ratio, and put the strength just where I need it, which is on the flanges where the tubing bolts in. Uh, so that's how that's done. Now, will all of this hold up during standard usage? I haven't a clue. I don't know. Uh, I hope it does. If it doesn't, I, I'm, I'm okay with experimenting with this stuff because it's the pilot's cage, and as I said before, I can always remove it and, and build a new one and build something stronger. Something like this that goes inside the wing that I can't get at, uh, this one I've over-designed and uh, I know it's going to hold up uh, in, in the wing it goes and I don't have to worry about this one. Uh, and by the way, this goes in the leading edge of the wing and when the outer wing panels come in, there's a pin that comes in here, goes in like this, and as the wing wants to twist, that pin transfers the torsional loads from the outer wing panel into the center section of the wing. Handy dandy. Uh, these tubes are the same. These, these tubes are for the uh, uh, wingtip panels, and this is going to get cut here. And uh, this is the, uh, the pin that will carry through, and uh, these smaller tubes transfer the torsional loads from the wingtip panels into the main wing panels. So, there we are. That basically answers Clive's questions. Very, very long uh, answer uh, to an interesting question, a short but really interesting question about how these designs get driven. So where we find ourselves with these designs is we're battling the buckling uh, monster and we're really not getting full utility out of the materials, what they can actually do. In fact, the other day I was thinking about a new material that we have coming along, you've probably heard of it, called graphene. Uh, and graphene is 10,000 times stronger than this stuff. Uh, but your basic graphene is one atom thick. They can make sheets of it that are one atom thick. How the heck do you get a hold of that? How do you grab it? Well, they're probably going to put it on cloth or put it on plastic. And so now, oh, wow, we got a material that's just phenomenally strong, but buckling is going to be the name of the game on that stuff. Every time you want to put it in compression, 
What's going to prevent it from buckling? And I started thinking the other day, how do we get a hold of these super thin structures that are incredibly strong in tension and almost as strong in compression as long as they don't buckle? How do we efficiently prevent local buckling yet grab a hold of these things so that we can attach them together? And it's a special problem for ultralight aircraft that we want to store or transport where we have to take the wings and or tail off on a regular basis. Anytime we have parts that we remove, we use bolts. Uh, and bolts are small, bolts are concentrated loads, and uh, we get ourselves backed into a design corner that's even worse. And I'm going to flip you around here, and we're going to take another look, and I'm going to expand this talk on to uh, where I think the future lies in these types of designs. So hang on for a moment, let me spin you around. Okay, here we are, we're back. Um, what I've done is I've taken the uh, test section of the wing, this is a seven foot long uh, full scale section of my current wing design, uh, but without the sweep in it. Just plopped it on top of the cockpit mock up here so we can talk about it. Uh, and I'm talking about stressed skin constructions, how skins are uh, carrying the loads that are in the aircraft, and then having to create that structure in such a way that we can put it on and take it off on a regular basis. And how we do that on most glider sailplanes and other powered ultralight aircraft is we have a main spar, like you see here. This is a classic I-beam spar. Um, and the skins get attached to the caps uh, of the I-beam construction. Uh, the loads go into those uh, spar caps, and they terminate here at a fitting, a big honking fitting here. And we put a big half-inch aircraft bolt in here that can carry all the loads. And, and you have fittings like this. And these are analogous to what's actually going on my current design. Uh, from the testing, uh, the half inch, uh, the bearing loads were too high on the carbon fiber. It dented it a little bit, so I've changed the design. Uh, these uh, fittings were half inch thick, and they tapered in thickness down to quarter inch, but they stayed full width. Uh, I've done kind of uh, the reverse thing here. These stay a half inch thick, but they taper in the other direction uh, so that I can make them wider here and put in the large diameter uh, tubing pin. Uh, to hold them together. So this is how we attach the wing. We've got big fittings on here. We put a big pin in here, and that's how everybody does it. Um, this spar was uh, built for this wing, but there was an error in building it, and I wonder who made that mistake. Uh, oh, yeah, that was me. So uh, I have an extra spar. Uh, so uh, this spar happens to weigh, it's seven foot long, and it happens to weigh seven pounds, um, so a pound per foot. So to create this structure where we have a stressed skin, the loads are distributed across this skin everywhere. And all of those loads are brought together into the spar. They move down the spar to a single fitting where we bolt the darn thing up. Sometimes you have a rear spar that has a fitting on it. I got a little fitting up here to carry the torsional loads. Uh, but what we're doing is we're taking distributed loads uh, that are spread out over a very thin skin and bringing them into one point. And <laughs> so I got 25 feet of wing, and I'm bringing all of those loads together and running them through this one pin and attaching it to either the other wing or the center section. So that means that this has to be really beefy. These fittings have to carry 30,000 pounds of load at six Gs. Uh, and you end up with these big honking fittings, even though they're carbon fiber. They're heavy. So this weighs a pound per foot, just the main spar that's in here. Um, so we have a 100-pound aircraft. We have 50 feet of wing. And the spar is going to average 8 tenths of a pound per foot, somewhere about that. 40% of the aircraft is in the spar. And you're thinking, well, what's wrong with that? That's what holds the wing together. Yeah, conventionally, that's what holds the wing together. Uh, at one time, we flew biplanes. And uh, it was all canvas, which doesn't carry any load, and some skinny sticks. And it was held together with cables and opposing structures, the two wings, biplanes. And the first person that went and built a monoplane with external bracing, they probably thought he was nuts. And then some guy came along and said, I'm going to do cantilever. I'm going to get rid of the cables because they're too draggy. And everybody thought he was nuts. And then several cantilevered wings broke off and said, see, we told you, you were nuts. Um, so we go through these phases of making leaps forward when somebody's willing to say, 
Well, okay, go ahead and call me nuts, but I'm going to go ahead and try this anyway and see if it works. We might uh, make progress that way. And that's kind of what I'm in the process of doing now. So, here we are. Suppose these Coke cans are my wing, right? That, that is my tube of wing. And they don't have a spar in them. They've got a couple of bulkheads. There's no spar. Uh, but the, we know that if these are pressurized, they're really strong. They're very strong in compression, even empty. But if I have to uh, uh, put my wing together and take it apart and put it together and take it apart on a regular basis, how do I attach these two thin shells together? Well, it, oh, well, look at that. They design them so they stack. Well, that, that, maybe that's part of the answer. Maybe I can steal that concept. But I got the aluminum so thin. How, how do you do this? Well, on full-size jets, uh, passenger jets, and so forth, those are semi-monocoque structures, the fuselages are, and uh, they're put together in sections. The sections are built elsewhere. They slide the sections together. And they're essentially thin skin. Uh, the aluminum's very thick, but for that size structure, they're very thin skin. How do they hold them together? Three or four rows of rivets all the way around. A lot of rivets, a lot of rivets. Well, we can't do that every time we go out. Uh, screws. Oh, would you like to put in 200 screws to put your wing sections together? I think not. Um, so, and, and it's just not practical. Uh, with an aircraft that's assembled all the time, stays assembled, that's not an issue. Monocoque structures, highly efficient, thin wall, stressed skin, and they're put together with rivets or bolts or other mechanical attachment methods. We don't have that nicety with the gliders that we have to take apart and put together all the time. Uh, so we end up using a regular old spar like this where we've got one pin goes in and we end up carrying around seven pounds of weight for that. So well, that allows me to make the skins a little bit thicker, thinner because this spar is carrying all the load. Uh, so I can make these thin, but I can't go any thinner than one layer of cloth. Uh, that's kind of hard. I can go really thin cloth i uh, got some new cloth that's coming out, the tech stream, stuff like that. Um, but then you get down into the crushing problem that I had in my original when You pick it up and it goes right in your hand. Uh, and that's a problem. So I thought, how much skin thickness does it take to carry the 30,000 pounds of load in the latest, greatest carbon fiber fabric? Because right now I have one layer of 1.7 ounce Kevlar on the outside of this thing. And I got one layer of 5.6 ounce carbon fiber on the inside, which is where all the loads are carried. Uh, and that's true up in the D-tube, and it's different in the back. If you go see the video on how this section of wing was built, you'll see all of the details on, on the skin. So these really, and it's on an eighth inch foam core, uh, and they really can't be made any thinner. This is construction that's highly similar to uh, the Swift and the Millennium and other similar gliders. Uh, they're all pretty much done the same way. Um, but how much skin thickness would it take to carry those loads? And I went and did, a little ways back, I did those calculations. And surprisingly, with some of the new fabrics that are out in epoxies, you could probably get by with, at the root here, you'd probably get by with three layers on each side, maybe only two. And for most of the wing, two layers, and out at the tip, one. And the loads are all distributed. The trick to it is, is I have to carry the loads in a distributed manner that way. Because it's only three layers thick, it's not going to take concentrated loads. If I put concentrated loads in a thin skin like that, it's going to buckle. We know what happens when you have buckling. It's a disaster. So I have to transfer the loads uniformly spread out over a wide area. So what I need to do is somehow magically attach together wing skins. Now, these are, these are typical wing skins here. The, these are a little, these are thinner. These are 16th of an inch thick. These represent what go out on the tip of my wing. And suppose, suppose this is one wing, this is the other wing, or maybe this is a wing center section, and I'm going to come in with my wing, and, there's, and, and I'm going to somehow attach these two skins together so that I can transfer the loads evenly everywhere, across here, and carry those distributed loads. Well, I can carry all the loads I need to carry with three layers of carbon fiber on here. But how do I hook them together? What if I had some kind of U-channel on here, like represent with my fingers, and this thing slid in to that channel. And inside that channel is some kind of magic adhesive so that when you push it in, boom, it's glued together, and it's solid. 
But if, and when you're done flying, you put maybe an ultrasonic vibrator thing on here. You vibrate it, and it liquefies the glue, and you can separate it. Well, that'd be cool. But I don't have any glue like that, and I don't know anybody who does. Uh, pretty fanciful thinking, but it's not practical, and don't know. So, how do you do that? How do you actually hold these two thin skins together, prevent buckling, and carry all those loads uniformly across here? Because if I manage to achieve that goal, here's what happens. It's pretty cool. This guy here, this huge spar, he is gone. I throw that spar away. There's seven pounds out of a seven foot wing gone. Um, yeah, the skins are a little thicker and they're going to weigh more. So you go do the calculations on it and you get rid of maybe 40, 45 pounds of spar and fittings and replace it with about 20 pounds of additional skin. Uh, that's a really good trade. So all of a sudden this aircraft that I've been working so hard on that I had to, get, to hold it at 100 pounds, to not go over 100, could all of a sudden be 80 pounds, maybe 75 pounds. If I can somehow figure out a way to put these skins together such that the loads are transferred evenly across the skins. And I come in, so I could have a monocoque or a semi-monocoque wing structure hollow down the center. It might only need two or three spar, spars that look like this, that are these thin panels. Maybe one, two, three, to prevent local buckling along this length. Maybe a few ribs in it, so it's kind of egg created. Uh, but maybe you only need three this way, and maybe you need five ribs out that way every 10 feet or so. Every couple of feet you put in, maybe just foam ribs. Maybe they don't even need fiberglass on them. I haven't done those calculations. But the wing would essentially be like this soda can, be a hollow tube with some local reinforcements, so semi monocoque, and somehow magically figure out a way to attach these skins together so that the loads are transferred evenly across those skins. That would be cool. So I get out to the field and I've got some kind of super magnet, a uh, skinny strip of super magnet, and I come in and they go boop, and they're stuck together perfectly and I can fly that way. And then I demagnetize it when I'm done and I take my glider apart and I go home. Well, I don't have those magnets either. Uh, but I'll let you in on a little secret here. I haven't uh, made this publicly known anywhere else until now. Um, I believe I've solved the problem. Uh, I've developed a mechanical system uh, for doing just this job. Uh, and I'm not going to show it to you today because I'm no fool. It might not work. <laughs> but I'm in the process of making samples and we're getting ready to test load those samples. And uh, if I'm successful, we'll be able to get rid of the spar and all its heavy fittings. And we'll go out to the field and we'll have some alignment pins to hold the skins lined up. We'll get in the field and the skins will get lined up. And then for lack of a better word, I'm going to zipper the two wing halves together. Uh, I'm going to have a mechanical connection system that evenly distributes the load across all of the skins. And no big spar fittings, no big bolts, all gone. Save all of that weight. We reduce the weight of a 15 meter glider uh, by 20% uh, by getting rid of that spar. Uh, and it's all a matter of preventing that local buckling uh, that was the subject of this video that was brought up because Clive asked a good question. Uh, and that brought us down to this point where I get to tell you uh, that I believe I've made some progress in this area and I might be able to solve this uh, little challenge and be able to create an entirely uh, new way of holding wings on aircraft. Um, and people will be shocked at first and will say, you're not going to fly on that, are you? And I'll say, yes, I am, because I've designed it and tested it. I know it'll work. It'll be the same comments that guy that did the first cantilever wing got. And uh, maybe the first one will break prematurely during test, and we'll have to beef it up and redesign. Uh, but I think I have the basic answer in hand. Uh, and it's something that can be used repeatedly uh, and uh, for a long period of time, durable. Take it apart, put it together, take it apart, put it together. And very lightweight. Uh, much less weight than two of these fittings. Uh, so uh, it's, it could be a breakthrough. Uh, and if I'm correct and successful, uh, you were lucky viewers. You got to be here on the day uh, that we first heard about this new wing attachment system. And uh, if it works and the first time you see it, 
Uh, you might chuckle and say, that's the silliest thing I've ever seen. Uh, but when it works, it could very well change how we look at how we design these types of aircraft and, and how we actually attach the wings and hold them on. So uh, you hang in there with me. You keep watching my videos. Tell your friends, cool stuff's coming. He's working hard to make breakthroughs and bring in a lot of new concepts to these types of aircraft. So tell all your friends, spread the word, get them to subscribe. And um, if you feel just a tiny, tiny bit generous, go over to my Patreon channel, uh, plunk down a few bucks per month, and help support my work and keep me going on this stuff. So, Clive, thanks for the question. It was great. It took us down a wonderful path. I hope you enjoyed this video, uh, and I hope I've held your interest and piqued it. Uh, so they can come back and you watch more videos in the future. Thanks much, and bye for now. Fly safe.